The circulatory system is as old as animals themselves. After all, the four goals of a metazoan are to move, eat, breathe, and have sex. And without circulating blood, there's no point to goal number three. Oxygen is critical to us animals because we need it for our mitochondria to break up carbohydrates and make energy. The oldest breathing mechanism was just diffusion, breathing through the skin. Diffusion is a very simple process. If one side of a wall has a lot of stuff, and the other side has a little stuff, stuff will eventually find its way through the wall. Now. There's a limit to how big the things going through the wall can be, but oxygen is very small and non-polar, so it has no trouble getting through the wall. And that's a fine process for sponges, who are covered in holes, jellyfish and comb jellies, who, you know, are jellies, and acelomate worms, who are squishy and useless, but if you want to be active like a protostome or deuterostome, you'll need to actively suck in oxygen. The process for accelerating passive diffusion involves this thing, countercurrent exchange. So diffusion occurs when there's a difference in concentration. Let's say this arrow represents your blood flow. Now, normally the maximum amount of oxygen you could suck out of the water was until the concentration equalized, but let's say your body has forced the water into a similar tube, and this arrow represents its direction. This blood will have the lowest oxygen level, and this water will have the highest. If they're going opposite directions, they'll both increase or both decrease. As the oxygen level of the water decreases, it will be posed against lower and lower concentrated blood, and it will find it has more and more to give. Our organisms found that they would have more oxygen than they would know what to do with, and all they had to do was boost their blood pressure and find some way of forcing water into that tube. So, the bigger the arrows are, the more oxygen, and the more energy, and the more life. Let's look at protostomes first. Protostomes have a cardiopulmonary system similar to that of the common ancestor of all circulatory systems. One of the biggest upgrades is the replacement of the entire skin drawing in oxygen to a couple of well-protected pouches. This allows them to upgrade their skin into an exoskeleton, or, you know, normal skin. The second upgrade is, of course, blood flow, creating the red arrow. Crabs and spiders have book gills, which are called that because they're layered like so. They make the blue arrow using what's called a scaphognathite, which pumps water in and out of the chamber. Spiders don't need to pump it because it's air, it flows in and out on its own. Spiders also have spiracles, these tiny little holes. Insects have only spiracles, which suck in oxygen and distribute it to nearby tissues without using countercurrent exchange, the blood flow isn't even connected to them, so it's pretty much every man for himself, and the density of spiracles on an insect provide a limiting factor for size. Lobsters, whose book gills scale up with them, can grow arbitrarily large, or at least respiration isn't the limiting factor. Spiralia, the chewy protostomes, have a much better cardiovascular system, because of one big change. See that? That's what's called an open circulatory system, and it means that the arteries just kind of turn the blood loose into the cells and trust that they'll eventually find their way back to the veins. If that sounds stupid, that's because it is, and the spiralians upgraded to a closed circulatory system that uses a network of capillaries to delegate the blood to the cells. Anellids are the simplest, and they breathe through their skin. Instead of a single muscular heart that beats, worms have up to ten beating blood vessels. Cephalopods are a bit more complex. They have two lung-like cavities that suck in water, and the blood gets expelled from the heart, flows through the body and loses its oxygen, then splits into two and gets refilled by the gills. To give it the extra push it needs to get over the finish line, two additional branchial hearts are added. This is typical of the protostomes, quantity over quality, but if you'd rather have one really good heart than three okay hearts, we can turn to the deuterostomes. In terms of open to closed circulatory system, Andulacrarians have about the most open you can possibly have, what's called a hemal system. I'll gloss over this now because it's another longer video, but they don't have blood vessels at any point in the process, and their coelums are crisscrossed to the rest of their cells until the whole thing is basically a giant sack of blood with organs floating around in it. Except it isn't blood, it's hemal fluid, which is basically seawater and the cells diffuse in oxygen on their own. The heart pumping this process is called an axial complex, and that's certainly another video. Echinoderms, the starfish, breathe through their skin, or I guess at their cells, but the four remaining groups all have one thing in common, pharyngeal slits. What's that? Poke your hand up against your neck and imagine a hole that went into your throat, such that if you reached a finger into your mouth, you could touch the two. You now have four or five of those on either side of your neck. What's the purpose of these? Well, something called filter feeding. The process is you take in a big gulp of seawater and then you can blow out all the water through the holes in your throat, leaving only the fish and stuff. To catch that, you force the water to rush through the holes. Yeah, it's no surprise that three out of the four groups elected to move their exchange membranes up against the gills. The lancelets, being useless, still breathe through their skin, but they did have the idea to switch over to a closed circulatory system. The vertebrates were on board. The tunicates might need some time to think about it.
So here are vertebrates. Blood is pumped out of the heart. Note that the heart is dealing with the deoxygenated blood, unlike a cephalopod, then split up to get oxygenated by the gills, which have water flow past them in a countercurrent exchange. From there, blood delivers oxygen to the organs in a closed circuit and arrives back at the heart, ready for more oxygenation. Say, say, that's a... Uh, that's quite a lot of organs. Are you sure this is going to be enough to power a whole organism? And the answer is no. We need upgrades. The first one is a two-chambered heart. You see, currently the heart functions a lot like a siphon. It has one-way valves on either side, and it just squeezes and... Wait for it to reinflate. Squeezes. Let's upgrade that to two chambers. This change is monumental. Now, there's no need to wait, because the pressure doesn't need to equalize in the vessels. The ventricle beats, pushing blood out into the body and all the way back around, filling the atrium. And since the pressure hasn't yet been equalized in the blood vessels, the newly inflated atrium can pump, filling the ventricle. And thus, the classic boom boom heartbeat was born. Another upgrade comes in the pulmonary side of things. This was ram ventilation. When a shark swims forward with its mouth open and gills closed, water is forced into the mouth. When it opens its gills and closes the mouth, pressure differences force the water out. By alternating the two states, the shark can maximize the amount of water flowing over its gills. The downside to this is that if it stops swimming forward, it suffocates and dies. Maybe this design needs upgrades too. It's a fish! With the mouth open and the gills closed, the mouth expands, drawing in water. Now, with the gills open and mouth closed, instead of moving forward, the mouth contracts, forcing the water out. Through the gills, that is. This process is called buckle pumping. On a completely unrelated note, fish also invented swim bladders. Fish need the ability to control whether they float or sink. And what better way to do that than to have a giant bag of air? You can fill it or empty it through your mouth. At least, that's how it used to be. Maybe that's too obvious, and we need a more high-tech solution. If you can fill your swim bladder directly through your mouth, you're a physo stone. If your swim bladder is filled and emptied with gases dissolved in the bloodstream, you're a physo -clist. There are a lot of advantages to physoclisty, mainly that you don't need to go to the surface to refill, but physostomy has its advantages too. For one thing, air coming straight from outside might have oxygen in it, so the blood flowing through it might be oxygenated. If you beefed it up enough, it might even be a viable alternative to gills. It might even be preferable to gills. And in some cases, you might not even need gills at all. So that's it. After a hundred million years of gills, we're just gonna throw them out? Well, the transition from gills to lungs was a long and arduous process. Many attempted it and fell by the wayside, a series of groups we collectively refer to as tetrapodomorph fish, or fishapods. That was until the tetrapods finally succeeded, and with a whole rework of the heart. Amphibians have three chambers, two atria and one ventricle. Now, when blood is pumped out of the heart, it splits into two. One half goes to the lungs to get oxygenated, but then it goes back to the heart. The other half distributes oxygen to the body and then returns to the heart. This is the dual circuit. Now, you may notice that instead of having a clear delineation between the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, they just sort of mesh together. And oxygenated blood goes to the lungs and deoxygenated blood goes to the cells. This may seem like it might cause problems, and it does, which is why amphibians had to bring back an old classic. <sighs> breathing through the skin. Now, the amphibians die if you so much as sneeze on them, so the reptiles decided that tougher scales were more prudent, even if it meant less oxygen and therefore less energy. And finally, the mammals. The mammals and birds were finally able to justify the switch from two to three chambers by removing the need for partially oxygenated blood via a four-chambered heart. And not a moment too soon, because we also have warm blood, which means we need about four times as much oxygen as a reptile. Blood goes out of the heart to the body as usual, and then regroups back at the heart, which sends it to the lungs to reoxygenate. And finally, it's back to the heart to be sent out to the body. To provide all of the oxygen that the heart now has no trouble distributing, the lungs no longer have to be buckle pumped, but are now heaved open by the diaphragm. The term for using muscles to wrench open the lungs is called aspiration. Not that aspiration. And it's also used in crocodiles, although they have a different muscle. Now, birds on top of being warm-blooded need crazy amounts of energy for flight, so they punched up the respiratory system even further. They have the same aspiration as a crocodile, but instead of inhaling and exhaling out the same hole, birds have a rolling cue. In the first inhale, oxygen gets sent to the back of the line, the posterior air sac. On the first exhale, it gets sent into the lungs where the oxygenation occurs. The second inhale sends it to the anterior air sac for holding, and then the second exhale evacuates it from the body. And because I had to deal with it for the entire grueling process of writing, recording, and editing, you're now breathing manually.